Welcome, one, welcome all to Elo Heaven. I am joined, of course, by our resident editor, funder, Vu Ciesco. He's in the middle. You can check out his latest work. It's even on uh, in Reddit right now, so you can go uh, toss it a uh, completely unrelated to this show upvote, if you like. And on the far right, we, of course, have Yumi. He's been casting some of the Blast qualifiers and some of the other UK stuff as well. Welcome to the show. I hope you are well-rested and taking some time off between this and your next cast. What's up, man? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm feeling not well-rested, but I'm okay. Like, my, the, the sleep schedule is yeah, always yeah. a hard one to, to buckle down on when you're doing regional qualifiers. But, I mean, yeah, I've kind of been just enjoying my day off. And uh, I, I've actually been diving into so, uh, some recent Netflix shows as well. There's okay. uh, there's one that came out about Dota that's, that's been kind of piquing the interest. So I've been, Interesting. been, been chomping away yeah. at that. What's it called? Do you, do you uh, Dota Dragon's Blood. And, any any anime, knowledge right? of this one, Boo? I think it's the anime, right? Like that's the yeah. It's it's kind of like styled like an anime, but then everybody's like, "Oh, it's not an anime because it doesn't come out." Listen, it doesn't. It doesn't <laughs> it's okay, it's classic, semantics. It doesn't whole. read right yeah. to left. It's not yeah, an anime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The <laughs> anime uh, elitists. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're not gonna listen. Remember when we had uh, one of your compatriots, one of your colleagues, tea time on the show? We opened the show talking about tea, of course, because obviously it has to be on brand. And then there, what and what resulted from that initial harmless segue was instantaneous, like, "Well, if you put milk in your tea, you're a fucking loser." And, and then tea time <laughs> had to counter argue with that. And then it was uh, just, well, it, just well, it wasn't that. Hell. It was just like. People people say that we only have bag tea here. That's like a thing. It's like, well, oh, okay. here here in the UK, we only have bag tea. And it's like, no, here in shitty Teaville, you only have bag tea. But like you can get loose leaf tea anywhere. Oh. It's not like a fucking, it, it's not like we're living in the 1700s and you got to take a okay. ship to China or some <laughs> shit to get the salt that you like. It's, it, it, you, you can get loose leaf tea anywhere, man. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, okay. I remember I used to I used to buy into like some some loose leaf tea, and when I had a, a few of my sort of uni friends at the time visiting, they were like, "Why? I, I just want a, like a, a normal cup of tea." <laughs> it's like, what do you, I mean? This is a normal cup of tea. Like, no, 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 no. like the, the ones we're talking about. So next time they came around, I had to buy like a, a hundred pack of Yorkshire tea that I don't, that I'm never gonna drink. So yeah, send it back. Well, home the good with shit them. is yes. um. They've got the little ball things now where you just like stick it in the ball and you stick it in. That's like way easier for mm. normies to understand. I feel like those work, you know? In a pinch, that'll do. Mm hmm. So, what else do we got going on here? Obviously, Vu, you just released a video. Of, I did name drop it earlier, but it's the, the nades that pros actually use, I believe, is the title. Can you talk? Yeah, nades pros actually throw. Yeah, sure, it's yeah. a okay. good video. A boxer Nathan. That, that guy, legit editor. Would recommend. Would recommend. There you go. 100%. But not too much, because if he gets too much work, then he can't edit for your videos, and then you're... you're I thought about that when I made the tweet. However, he was good enough that it was worth it. There you go. All right. And the the last sort of housekeeping we have here is, of course, we do have a slightly restyled logo. uh, That's courtesy of Adam Hepburn over at Splang Studio. You can obviously check that stuff out in the description. Nice enough guy. Just sent us in. I offered to pay him for his services, and he was like, no, just give me a shout out. I was like, all right, well, somebody opting into being paid in exposure, which was... uh, Maybe somewhat related tangentially to the previous episode that we did of Elo Heaven with Thorin. So if you missed that somehow, you can check that out. <laughs> Obviously, kickstarted a very different uh, saga. And it's been a while since we've been back on for Elo Heaven, a couple of, maybe a couple of weeks now. So what's been going on? Anything piquing your interest, Yumi, in the CS space? Or it can really be, I mean, we just talked about tea for like five minutes. So it can be pretty mm. much anything you like. Uh, anything that sort of piqued your interest? I, I think if we're, if we're, Kind of talking about Counter Strike, we can't ignore the fact that there were there were a few teams that looked really really good in 2020, and I think Big was kind of one of them, and okay. now they don't even make it through the EPL group stage. So, yeah. uh, disappointing for sure. I'm a big Searson fan, big fan of Tabson himself as well, and it just I I, I haven't I haven't been able to watch through all of those games. I I think we maybe have a little bit of a discussion beforehand as well. Just EPL has been kind of a, a fleeting content ingestion uh, i suppose as, yeah. as of late but it is it is just really odd that that has suddenly turned around especially when a large part of the narrative was like oh it's all online it's like it's still online so why is this why is this happening now 
Yeah, what's really curious to me about the format of APL anyway is that I feel like we've seen this time and time again in countless different esports, the whole round robin side of things that does make some games inherently meaningless in terms of one mm. team's result at the very least. In worst case scenario, you can have a, just a meaningless game entirely for both teams, but usually that part doesn't happen. What's just very puzzling to me is we've seen that time and time again where maybe teams just don't take it as seriously, but it's still impactful for the other team on the other side of the bracket. I guess everybody obviously wants to win all of their matches, certainly not alleging anything untoward, but it does feel just a little rough when that happens. And maybe that was at play in some of Big's later matches when it was obvious they weren't going to make it through. That might have been one of those situations. Just theory crafting. Again, I personally didn't see any of those, but it's funny you mentioned Searson as well as, as a fan because he's at an opera we've talked sparingly about on this show. And it is one of those things where almost like Zentara's in a way, he, he was kind of famously touted as like an, perhaps an online only opera hasn't been yeah, land yeah. tested yet, but it's been so long that surely that shouldn't be a factor either. Just like you said, it's everything's online. Everything's been online. Why, why would that factor in? So Vu, do you have any, any insight onto big specifically? I mean, we all, none of us have necessarily watched every single EPL game. Obviously I've barely watched any at all. So maybe you have some, some thoughts on why big might be struggling now. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how to put it. It's big. Big had their really, really good period, right? Where they were absolutely amazing. Yeah. And um, they won, I think, several events. They, I mean, they, they're they a really good team to learn from. Regardless of their yeah. outcome in, in any of these, they are a very good team to learn from. And to be fair, like most of their games in, in this, you know, in, in EPL here have been very close. But I think losing to Renegades, who have looked not very good recently, is something that you... You, you can't, it isn't really acceptable. That being said, yeah. I mean, you, you have mentioned they were probably, you know, they were out of it by that time. So do they really care? And their games were all fairly close. But I mean, if you, nobody's giving the benefit of the doubt to Cloud9, except for a few people um, for being, mm. you know, Cloud9 consistently has close games. Like if you look in EPL, um, right now they went two and three in EPL so far. Uh, I think that's the end of it, right? Um, the, oh yeah, I remember the memes about it. They went two and three. They're pl positive 13 round differential, right? Better than Navi in round differential, even though Navi is three and two. Um, but nobody's giving them a slack for that. Like, nobody gives a fuck. They're just like, oh, well, you lost the game. And that's what sure. really matters. And it. so Big Big had a lot of close games, but and they were already out of it by the time they played Renegades, right? But still, Renegades has not looked very good with Dexter so far, and Big losing to them doesn't it doesn't make me very happy or confident. Yeah, and one of the things that I saw when people were discussing big in general is that maybe singling Zantara's out as the odd man out, obviously, literally, based on nationality. And he is putting his best foot forward, as far as we can tell, outside of the game in terms of learning you know, German and trying to make those comms a little bit more cohesive. Mm -hmm. But it does feel like something is missing, and it's, it is kind of hard to pick any one point. Uh, this is another thing I've actually heard about Big specifically. Maybe this is echoing from By the Numbers. But one of the things that I did notice about the conversation around Big is that everybody who has uh, criticism almost seems to talk to somebody different or talk about somebody different, targeting one specific player or a combination of like how two players hold a bomb site together on CT side or what the entry pack does. Like it almost seems like everybody has a different idea to some extent of what Big's problems are. And maybe that that changes event to event or series to series, maybe even map to map in some cases. So I am a little concerned that whatever the solution for Big's problems are, or is it might be more than just one. It might, might be more than one move or one sort of role shuffle, but they are a team that hasn't made an actual roster move in quite a little while in terms of counter-strike standards, especially in the online era. So do you think that Yumi, they could pivot towards like maybe an all German lineup again, pick somebody up from like Sprout or one of these other, you know, I say it almost in jest, but the feeder teams of the German league, do you think that that might be something they could pivot to? Yeah. I, I don't know if that's even really, really the solution that I would look at because uh... If you if you look at the run in 2020, I think it's it's fair to to this is maybe not even really backed up but by anything. I haven't had uh, sort of uh, players agree, or I haven't even brought this point up to them. But I think just in the fact that Sirison was being such a great player independently, you know, he was one of the first few out of the Orpers that would frequently pick into scouts, and I think that's bled yeah. through into other teams ever since. So, so to have such a, 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 I think what is a big influence on the pro scene, especially with how the economy is being having to be navigated nowadays, I, I think they were they were at the forefront, but now every team is sort of caught up, and now they they have kind of lacked that additional innovation in terms of 
how to to approach economy management, whatever. I I, I don't think that they need a, a change effectively. I I like the, a lot of the roles on big. I think they don't have maybe the clear uh the clear star. I mean, Zentaris is one, but I feel like you need to have a, sort of like a supplementary star alongside them. You look at like Navi with Perfecto and Electronic, like they're they're pulling stars and making them support players, but they're still really really solid. Um. Maybe that's something that you, you can maybe look to, but I don't think the communication is, has been something that I would really target there for big. I don't think they have to go back to a, a sort of national roster as much as maybe German fans may want something like that. Um, so the one thing that was, I think, a really good point there is that they were kind of innovative when when they had their their really good run. They were doing a few things. And then we talked to, uh, who was it we had in here a few months ago from, from X Big? Or he was like, there's social oh, media. Oh, Drawlin. Yeah, you're thinking of Drawlin in the second episode. Yeah, we had him. And he, w he was, uh, the, the title of that episode is In Your Face with a Mac Daddy. You know, those like, those little, those really quick plays where you just throw, you dump a tiny bit of utility. First player jumps out instantly, catches people throwing counter utility, and you go from there. Like, that's something that not very many teams were running. And it's still not the most common thing, but I think you see a lot more teams running that nowadays. Um, probably picking it up mostly off of big and, and Searson is an opera who I recommend to people not to try and recreate his style, but because he does a lot of peaks and plays that you typically wouldn't have seen from other people. For example, he'll go around truck side on Inferno, wait out the Molly and boiler and then peek out alt after the Molly is down sometimes. And that's not a play you would typically see. It's, it's got, it runs some risks. But you also do see it work out decently well a good amount of the time because people aren't ready for it. Other people aren't running it. And so he's a great player to learn from and pick up some of his plays. But I do think that other teams have picked up some of their plays as well. And when it comes to communication, I mean, the problem is I wouldn't look at communication as, as the biggest issue for big. However, when you look, when I'm looking at their match history, they've had so many close losses that sometimes communication is the thing that's kind of like, you know, you've got 13, 14 rounds, and yeah, maybe that yeah, one yeah. little miscommunication can be the thing over the top. But I'm not sure replacing Xanthrez is the solution. It's kind of tough, though, because Xanthrez is a player who is, you would look at as their star player, you know, he's put in a lot of good spots. But when you have a star player that does typically underperform against top-level opposition, which I think is true of Xanthrez, uh, maybe not like massively underperform. I think he's gotten better with it. But when he's a player that you can't look at him and say he's going to do as well against top 20 as top five, yeah. um, it, it can cause some problems because you go against the top five team and you're trying to play your style and what you know is going to work. And then just the fragging isn't there in the same way. And that can cause some some problems in terms of like just consistency in general. But then you also try and change things to fix that. And, and you haven't really attacked the, the root of the issue. And then you end up reinventing some things. But that's not actually fixed anything and that might make you even more susceptible to losing to top 10 teams instead of just the top five teams and that can cause some issues as well so i don't know i don't know if, if a roster move is necessarily what they need they might just need some time and, and maybe like one big result to give them that confidence to put them over the edge because i think that makes you know especially when it comes to teams that are coming close constantly they have that one sick result puts them over the top and then they just have the confidence and they roll with it right i feel mm -hmm. like they've lost a little bit of that recently you know no, they're certainly not even the only team to have surprisingly underperformed in these EPL groups, right? And uh, one of the other things to consider is whether or not the format does have a massive thing to, to sort of play into that. I guess one of the other interesting aspects of EPL so far have been how some of the underdogs have done, right? Obviously, Gambit, we're not really underdogs by any means, but they won their group seemingly fairly handily. I think Fury is next in line behind them if they want to make it out. Maybe they already have, as a matter of fact. So again, I, I'm a little hairy on the rules, personally. I don't 100% uh, know what all of the standings mean or, or what all of the head-to-heads do. From what I saw, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but I think Striker from HLTV had a tweet where where he had he had everything in a spreadsheet for every possible outcome for I think group C and there was like eight or ten different like potential matchups and based on who t who won this and who had the round differential <laughs> have you guys been able to make heads or tails of this like pretty crazy format for my money like obviously it's a departure from what we normally see and in that it has some novelty value but 
I, I, feel, I don't know. I personally feel like it's a little whack. I'm interested in either of your guys' takes on, on how the format's been shaping up so far. Is it that different from... Because I know Blast ran their groups, right? Um, what for... I don't think they were round robin is the thing. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. I mean, I, I think... Yeah. I, I've said this before. I'll, I've said this before. It's just like, I think every, I think there's, there's value in having like representation of more, um, of more formats because then it really, it kind of does draw eyes to like, well, here's the format that we really like. And it makes it more nice when a tournament has the perfect format. But yeah, I mean, there's always been complaints about round robins, right? Especially matches after it's like, it, it's, it doesn't matter for one team and it matters for the other. Those are always kind of suspect. Yeah, I mean, uh, just even the fact that these are four groups of six, I think is a, a, a huge, huge thing as well, because not only do you end up in situations where, where some groups are more stacked than others, that's that's a whole other ball game about how many teams you let in and yeah, and yeah. just how how you run the, the seating and everything. Um, but it, it is it does lead into that where you shouldn't I don't even feel like you should have this narrative where, oh, this team beat this team, but it didn't matter. Right. And And having redundancies is uh, a bit it is a bit annoying i think in terms of building up a story for for a team because it could be a really big win for for like an underdog but it's it's now seen as a oh it doesn't matter like yeah, it's just exactly. basically written off effectively yeah that's that's just one of the weirder things about any sort of round robin is that it does reduce the meaning of the game like the impact of each way like mm -hmm. here's here's another angle right in the online era which obviously we've been in for quite some time now I've already had this innate sense that the results are have a little bit of an asterisk next to them. We have to pretend like they don't. We have to be like, oh, this team should beat this team like nine out of 10 times. Oh, it's an upset. Whoa, crazy. But yeah. whatever the analysis actually is, it does feel like maybe you know, people are, are a little bit too focused on the here and now. And, and and I think maybe because of that, they can't see the bigger picture. And it's almost like you don't want to because it changes so radically from time to time. Like last year, we obviously had a crazy number of different teams get HLTV number one, for example, which isn't a perfect metric for who the best team is, especially when we have some region locking. But I really do feel like my concern with how the overall ESL Pro League stuff has played out is you already have that asterisk of the on games being online and all the different, you know, ping and all this other stuff that can help decide matches in favor of one player or another. The fact that wide swinging, as Yakinder has shown us, is such a useful strategy now, so, so viable at the top level where previously it wasn't. Then you add on the round robin side of things where, well, one team this is a meaningless game for them. Um, you know, maybe not meaningless in the sense that if they lose it, they still get harangued by fans and all this other stuff. And people are still going to bet on these matches, obviously. So you can bet the death threats will continue to come through in their Twitter DMs. But aside from, you know, essentially externalities, maybe their HLTV rating or something, there's not really going to be a huge push to make sure you win every single match when you're already banged out or you're already in, you're already secured, which is what we saw with Furia, for example, where they were already secured and then they got upset pretty handily at that point. So that's one of those cases where that match didn't matter for Cloud9. It didn't matter for Furia. Either way, Cloud9 were out and Furia were in. It just, it adds so many question marks that don't need to be there that that's my main gripe with the format so far. And you talked about six teams, like four groups of six. That's another thing as well. I just feel, it, it does feel so, so rough to consider like who did the seeding, who put these teams together because People have talked before, groups of death, groups of life, like who's got who's got the yeah. easiest group to get out, who's got the hardest. Like, I guess if we go down that thread, have there been any teams that have genuinely surprised you in a positive way? Or like anything where these all these question marks, all these asterisks don't almost like don't hold water? Because for example, like NIP and N's topping their group as an example, G2 squeaking out, vitality dropping out. Like maybe some of these are expected, but there's been so many changes, and that's just in one group alone, that I wonder how many situations we can realistically say like i think phase should definitely have gotten out of their group they don't so vitality are next in line they also don't like that's a group of upsets into an in and of itself I, does any anybody have any ideas as to how that could come to fruition is that just the teams actually playing better or does the format play into this what do you guys think 
Uh, which one's which one of us taking us first? Um, uh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I, I mean, I guess I'll I guess I'll go because I you know I spoke first in it. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I I think for Phase it's it's hard because it's it's a leadership change and trying to get a ring on things is a little bit more difficult. For Vitality, they're also in this spot where they've kind of been exploring this six man roster thing and now that's not going to be panning out. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, I I do think that that has some influence on how they did perform in that second group but also i think it's a it was a conscious decision that they made last year to move into a six-man roster because they wanted to try and open up options for zaiwu as a as a star player and it did work for a little bit like that that little honeymoon period when they they went for the the initial showing looked looked great and everyone was like oh this is how you run six bad rosters yada 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 sure, yeah. and then we started to see the performance kind of decrease a little bit there for vitality so I I don't know. I I almost feel like they they're scheduled a a roster move soon. I think there's going to be a, probably another couple tournaments before we we likely see rumors spur up about who goes where. Um, but I guess uh, on a more positive note, really surprised that Heroic and and Nip have looked uh, looked solid. The fact that they topped both of their groups, I I didn't think Heroic were gonna look anywhere near as 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 good as this. In, in spite of the fact that I rate a lot of the the roster moves that they were able to impl implement. They they were also kind of on a downturn, so this this sure. roster move has just seemed to kind of fit the bill. I mean, nobody. I don't think people really expected the heroic roster move to do all that well either, right? Like, wasn't the community reaction to the heroic roster move like pretty overwhelmingly negative, if I remember correctly? Mm -hmm. um, thinking that that wasn't really going to solve anything. I mean, uh, personally, I've I've really liked heroic for pretty much the entirety of the online era. I think they do a lot of things that that other teams aren't necessarily doing all that effectively. And I I think especially, you know, their results on Mirage haven't always been the best of all time, but I think the way they play Mirage is something that's like really really learnable. Um the because they've they've had a um They've had this way of playing Mirage where sometimes they'll they'll just send their cat player to play Connector when he's got one of the better spawns because with the best spawns for for mid you can jump out window safely and then you can get free damage on a toss nade top mid or you can get free information you can get like really good info and easily push up and and contest. They were a team that that was really good uh, in my opinion at um, managing how many players you're playing B because most teams typically just play really heavy on two B. I mean this has been changing but. This is um teams have been playing overly heavy on 2B when if you think about it in reality, how many times is your is your opposition really rushing B? If you have two players there, it's basically an auto loss round anyways. So, you know, you can gamble and play 1B a decent amount of the time. Like I think a lot of things Heroic have been doing has has been really really good um and, and somewhat innovative in just that they're not necessarily just trying to stick with the the pro meta um so i love to see heroic doing well like i love to see teams like heroic and unfortunately not but you know i love it if the big was doing well as well that are teams that are like pretty in, in my opinion strategically sound and i think nip is relatively strategically sound as well which probably plays in when you look at a, a, a round robin group sure. you're gonna have a lot a little bit less you know at least there's going to be less pressure to can't, uh, anti strat your opponents because it's not like, well, we win this or work, we go home. So mm. teams that have a really good base, I think, are going to do really well, um, which is, you know, potentially why, uh, you know, you see a team like FaZe, who's just had some changes, not do quite as well. Um, and, and I think, I think, any, honestly, in my opinion, anti stratting is something people don't. Um, don't think pros do as much as they do, which is like small stuff. Like we're going to need, you know, this nade's going to be really effective at this timing or that timing, right? And I, I think people don't really notice it quite as much as it, it goes on. I don't think pros want you to know how much they, they anti strat either, to be fair. fair if, yeah. if everybody thinks that, that nobody's putting in the work, then, you know, you're not going to get punished as heavily, right? So, um, but th I think that's as well, just more and more teams bring in analysts. So actually they don't even maybe have to do as much legwork themselves yeah. they can sort of be filled in the details afterward kind of like a scouting report on what the team is going to be um uh doing or whether this this new play that they've been trying out has been working that type of thing so it's 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 always an interesting little meta game between two two teams and, and uh, that's that's where all that commentary jargon comes through where we start going like oh how how prepared are they going to be for this type of play sure, you know yeah. we've seen we've seen him do it the past two maps yeah well 
apparently being prepared is um, we talked about Cloud9 very brief, briefly earlier on, and I, I do hate to be another body on the dog pile, but their results in this particular group were not all that spectacular. They weren't necessarily favored to make it out. It does have Gambit, Navi, Furia, and I would say mm-hmm. even like MIBR and Team One aren't the easiest opposition to just dismiss. Mm-hmm. Also, I. Not to, this is a complete tangent, but I do think it's kind of wild that we've got two CIS teams and three Brazilian teams in the same group. Like that, feel, that does feel a bit odd. Like Cloud9 are just like surrounded on all sides, but like not, you know, thugs and gangsters in the good way, we'll say. Just like you got all the tats, you got all the, the muscle bounds, you got the connections, you know, it's the hood. And they're, they're and, and the group B neighbor. is like the the roster move group where like everybody is swapped a player out oh, in like yeah. the last three months or something yeah. is. Oh, yeah, and yeah. Enzo just like a brand new lineup and all that stuff. Yeah, it's just, it's yeah, yeah. interesting how, like, maybe it's just pattern recognition. Humans are kind of born to do that, mm-hmm. so of course we will. But it does, it is kind of funny how we get like that, uh, that synergy almost between all of the different teams, all of the, the similar storylines going in. So that was just something that caught my eye. But, but for Cloud9 specifically, you know, I don't remember if this was, I, I don't want to be say that I'm outing, uh, a per, you know, privileged information. I can't remember if this was said on the last episode of its server time with Maui Snake, but it might have just been in the, in the virtual green room. Either way, it's not that big of a deal. Basically, Josh Mix was like, we're going to fucking destroy Navi. And obviously that didn't happen. So because of that, um, I just have to say, sorry, better luck next time. Hopefully it'll be sooner rather than later. What, did you guys catch much of the Cloud9 action on any of their series? Because obviously the most impressive one was the Furia Stomp, but that was after Furia were already in. Yeah, no. I mean, <laughs> I feel like Cloud9's, they're, they're not getting, here's the thing, okay? They're not an amazing team right now. It's not like they're, they're being super duper impressive. Sure. However, they have run a lot of very close games. I yeah. think they they just need a little bit more to push them over the line. They need something else. Um, and it, it might just come with time. But they're also just like, they are getting, I feel like they're getting kind of unlucky in these types of group draws, like running into Gambit, Fury, and Na'Vi. Those are three teams that are going to be, you know, in theory, very hard for a roster to play against without like a, a ton of synergy and, and a ton of like confidence. Um and I mean, they did beat Furia, uh, but I feel like, you know, if they run it, I, I'd be more confident if I was a Cloud9 fan, if they ran into a different, like pre seeing Heroic 5-0, if they were in that group or something, I feel like I would be more confident in Cloud9's ability to get out of it. That being said, I mean, they did, I mean, Cloud9 did, they shouldn't be losing to MIBR, I think. MIBR really should be kind of just like pretty easy for them it's furia navi gambit and so the fact that they beat furia but lost to mibr doesn't make me any any more hopeful yeah hit or miss yeah. right i because I, I remember watching cloud nine in the um dreamhack master spring close qualifiers oh and... the famous bulgarian incident is what you're referring to right <laughs> i mean it, it's it, that is one of them but uh, I, I i wasn't able to catch that like on stream um obviously sure. i just i saw i saw the clip arise afterwards but even in the games i, I was watching they were just they just had the, such an issue kind of closing down rounds and that just looked like a, a disciplinary thing where you know like treat every round like it's your last type of mentality didn't seem to be there you know people not clearing angles being so like almost lazy effectively uh, and that's something that i imagine will change over time but if it, it i mean even if you highlight the fact that they are losing closer games you can imagine like even if there isn't a massive crazy mistake that'll make it to the top of reddit and you know everybody just has a, a flame fest over them um that the the small little hiccups or maybe it'll be a, a longer rotation on something like that if that isn't just drilled in that you just need to be treating everything every moment like it's your last effectively then you you can see how they might lose rounds that they they really shouldn't or maybe should have a, a better chance in fighting into them just because you know, timings are off or somebody doesn't throw an aid when they're supposed to type of thing. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I, I've actually downloaded every Cloud9 game, well, less the, the most recent ones they played um, from from 2021, because I noticed in, in, in when I was looking at Cloud9, I looked at, you know, um, a decent number of their games, but not every round. I noticed that Zeppa had like this consistent problem where he would peek out just before a flash pop and get and get murked and um and i'm like i'm I'm actually trying to look into i wanted to look and see how many times has he done that like it, it just seemed that that's one of those small issues that seems like something that should be pretty easy to fix up but it was just weird to me that i saw it like multiple times where it's just like 
Um, for example, Arch on Inferno, he's sitting in the smoke and then he's running through, but the flash has not yet popped. He gets killed. The flash gets popped. And, um, you know, either, you know, sometimes someone's there, sometimes like there's been times where someone hasn't been there and it could be intentional. Like to be fair, some of it could be intentional where it's like, we're going to try and catch someone. If they're playing anti-flash, the flash is going to pop. And if they're not playing anti-flash, we're going to kill them. It didn't really feel like that to me, but there are just small things like that, that, that really do leave me a little bit concerned, you know? I would be concerned if I was constantly getting team flashed, if that's what you mean. Or is this the enemy flash thrown? What, no, I, this I is think, just I, like he'll run out through a smoke before a flash pops oh, and I see, die because the flash has not yet popped. I see. It could be like a like a win more condition, effectively, if, if somebody is playing anti-flash, right? Somebody that's supposed to be mm. Yeah, it definitely could be intentional. Like it definitely yeah. could be. It just didn't look, it didn't feel that way to me. So I need to look at it and see, like, do they do this often enough that, like, this has to be intentional? It just seems like a mistake to me. Mm-hmm. What do we make in general of the latest uh, role swap then? Considering they tried a op Alex, now they're trying to op Essa tag. People keep talking about, like, obviously Kenny S on the free market. Tons of oppers on the free market. Before Smuya was signed with Mavistar Riders, we, Vu and I were both arguing for him. Which, um, well, maybe would be a personality conflict, but if they can work past that, they can reap the rewards. Like, I'm just waiting to see a real, like, battle-tested primary opper on the Cloud9 roster. And I feel like it's a bit odd that we haven't seen that yet. What do you, what do you make of that, Yumi? I, I, I've I held this opinion for a long time. I don't even know why they, they came out swinging, saying that everybody was going to be doing these roles when they were basically picking up very, very highly versatile players. Like, I think at the start, almost every one of the, the players had picked up an AWP at some point or another or had done some sort of a supportive role. Um, so it didn't really make sense to me that they, they went with that. But I I, th I think it's just going to take a little bit. It's, it is going to be a longer project to sure. get Essa Tag to be a star opper, as well as even get the the Cloud Nine roster off the ground. Like you could see with the with the whole OG project, it took a while before Montu looked like he does a bit more now, right? He he was all he put himself in poor positions, would only get one kill, would kind of uh, just cause these small little blunders that would lead you to lose more rounds than you should do on, on OG. And I can only imagine that's going to happen as well for Cloud9 when I don't think they can be afforded that amount of time considering this is already coming up on a, a, a year-long project that hasn't really got its legs off the ground. What do you Has make it, it really been that long? It's been a while. It's been nearly a year? Well, think about well, it. I think, I, they I formed think before Flashpoint 2, so... Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're like getting up there. A couple months. It has been a while. Huh. One of the things that, yeah, I mean, I don't like S tag offing, to be honest. I feel like he's, I feel like if he's put in the right positions to succeed, he, he can absolutely succeed if, if, if things are right. Um, and I don't think it's that he's not going to be a good opera. It's just that you need, like you need a star opper and i don't know if esetag is gonna be a star opper i'm i think of him more kind of like um i think of him more as like let's think maybe like how i used to think of alu which is just like he's gonna lock down angles pretty effectively um you know maybe alu a few years back he would lock down effect um mm -hmm. angles pretty effectively he wasn't necessarily going to be hyper aggressive the way you might want um and it's a big change from from an opera like woxic to an opera like esetag yeah um, true i mean it's, it's esetag doesn't seem to just take his awp and like attach like a little rocket booster from one of those subreddits like the uh the, you know the subreddit that they did all the betting on wall street bets and he just like takes that rocket emoji and puts it on and just rockets it out towards the enemy team and just says here you go here's my op <laughs> it doesn't usually do that i think i don't i've seen not seen too many games but i just i feel like they should have an opera honestly i don't know it's it's felt to me like it should be this is gonna sound kind of crazy it's felt to me for a little bit like it should have been minus s tag plus a real opera um but like how do you you can't really swing that if you're c9 like yeah we paid unbelievable amounts of money for this guy let's just remove him and uh bring in you know someone else uh now, here's the just, here's I the mean, mixed second, messaging i mean walks is gone already so yeah, yeah like here's the mixed messaging for me is they cut Woxic and Kassad loose pretty early in the project's history. And those guys probably weren't the cheapest. Like maybe Woxic was on a discount. We don't really know. But like, I'm pretty sure Kassad, I don't know what, what his 
if he had a buyout or whatever, I'm pretty sure that wasn't the case at that point because his team had pretty much just disbanded and exited CS entirely. But mm -hmm. I'm sure he had a salary is what I'm getting at. And the idea that they're willing to part ways with that and let him go so early because they're kind of cutting their losses and saying, if it doesn't work and we know it's not going to work, even though it's only been two, three months, just get it over with now. Rip the bandaid off. I do agree with Vu in some sense that they probably should have done that with Esetag. I think maybe the sunken cost fallacy is just a couple million dollars higher in that sense in, in the case of Esetag. So maybe they are having a bit of a difficult time uh, making that decision. I do feel like it would be I don't know, man. I I feel like either an experienced opera or a highlight opera from like up and coming region or something to that effect. Either one, you, you could go for the veteran status, but somebody who's proven, you could go for maybe a gamble, like a walk sick like gamble on Kenny S or Guardian. Um, you can go for, I don't know, there's so many things that you could do. You could also go for somebody who's just an unproven, but it does feel a little odd that uh, Cloud9 are now relying so heavily on like Floppy and Zeppa to get things done on their rifles. And as a tag at best might be like a, a clothesline offer, shall we say, just like holding an angle and, and left clicking when he sees an enemy, which I mean, that's one style of opping that's almost sort of like device back in like 2018 or whatever. But it does feel like this team needs a little bit more something a little bit more proactive. I, 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 this might be my own bias coming in, but I actually think that the best looking parts of the Cloud9 roster are, actually, are floppy and, and mezzi. And I haven't maybe seen as much of the, the Zeppa integration as I would like, but those two seem to be the best. And when, when, if with my with my assumption or with my with my take on it, I I don't see how your unproven player that you think can be a star or like a closer for your team them being one of the best looking pieces when he's probably the the least expensive component is is really all too feasible and so you you are you almost tunneled into pushing into getting an older star opera or somebody that's more of a free agent that's more proven just because you would then have too many unproven pieces to this project and i only think that extends the timeline more and mm. i think i think they they, they just kind of push themselves into a, a triangle shaped hole and now they're trying they're very desperately to fit this square in there uh so when it comes to zeppa i think personally i agreed with with i think floppy's been one of the more promising players mezzi um i like him but it's still i wouldn't i haven't put him over the line of being like one of my favorite players but um zeppa has been from the games i've seen zeppa has either drag them to the finish line and they've failed to cross it or he's occasionally dragged them over the finish line yeah, in yeah. a lot of rounds mm. where I've seen them just I've seen just almost like implosion rounds where just two or three players in a row just don't get a kill they should get and then Zeppa is just here and he's like picks up a three or a 4k and he makes the round winnable um like Zeppa's definitely for me the most impressive player on the squad currently um, and I think without Zeppa, if they had just, you know, if Zeppa had been a flop, this roster would be dead in the water right now. I feel like, you know, the fact that they've got, you know, some promise is, is a lot to do with Zeppa doing really well. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think Esetag can do well. I think, um, one of the things is I think Astralis is a team where, um, the reason Zipnix even works, I don't think Zipnix, I, I I've. I think it's been said multiple times now, if, if I remember correctly, that like Zipnix was on the docket for Cloud9 potentially. Yes. And, and, and I think that would have been a fucking awful move because I think Zipnix is a player who, look, he can get things done when he's allowed to do his thing, when he's put in these late round scenarios and they don't really rely on him too much. He's just kind of, he's like the icing on the cake, you know, he can, he, he can hit it out and he can do what he does well. But if you put him on this cloud nine roster, that would be a travesty. Like that would, it would not work at all, I think. And I think something similar has kind of happened with Esetag before he picked up the op where he, he just wasn't, you know, I don't think he had the ability to do what he does best. And now he's picked up the op, and I don't think that's necessarily what he does best. Um, so th I think they're kind of between a rock and a hard place in terms of what where they go from here, because it is the players that have done the least, like technically in the past, that are the players that I think are, are mm -hmm. the most promising. Yeah, the ones who with the least amount of documented accomplishments, especially at tier one, seem to be the ones that are 
essentially the most actionable for this roster. Can we talk about Astralis a little bit then maybe? Because, you know, we, we touched on, on Zipix being a bit of a different kind of player and needing a very specific setup in, indeed. Obviously, Esetag making his way out of that roster, making bank, in fact. Um, we talked repeatedly about Bubski and how he's uh, seemingly indoctrinated into the Nikola Nyholm cult. What, what did we make uh, overall of, of how Astralis are taking shape? Because they just lost two evil geniuses. And that is obviously not a result I don't think anybody expected. So having not watched Actually, the game... Actually, Wanders oh. has a video on it. He said why Astralis or um, EG is going to beat Astralis. He, he has a video on it. Did he release that video? That was for like Blast. He released it like fucking three months ago yeah. when they played the, before. <laughs> like, so it wasn't exactly released for this. And I mean, like if we're going to go back, I have said like EG is a team that even when they're not doing that well, technically, okay. they have been um, tough for Astralis to beat. They've They've got a style that I think has been tough for Astralis to beat in the past. So I don't think it was necessarily all the way out of left field, you sure. know, when it comes to EG versus Astralis. I think... Let me see. Their series are two and two or three and two, I think, for Astralis, something like that. It, it's not super, super duper one-sided. Um, and I did kind of like... So Magis didn't do great this series, right? But um, watching their Inferno, I, I mentioned um, last time with, with Thornon that I looked at all of Magis' gun rounds. Every gun round he's had in 2021, it's like 50 gun rounds, or gun versus gun, right? Um, yeah. And there was like two rounds where he got like multi kills that weren't just gifted, right? Like from a specific angle where it's like guaranteed you're gonna get two. Um, when when it's been like get one and then and then push yourself to get a second that you're not gifted, he's he's really struggled with that in 2021. And although he didn't do amazing this series, he on Inferno he actually looked, in my opinion, quite good on Inferno, and he was creating some opportunities and doing things quite well and i think his teammates didn't necessarily help him out too much on the a site um in, in several rounds uh i think he did a pretty solid job so at the very least i think there that's looking up he's still not he still didn't do great on nuke i think there's been some role changes there um that might take a little while but at the very least the the biggest flaw i saw in astralis looked a little bit better in this series than i've seen in 2021 if I'm not mistaken, though, when, when Magis first entered the roster, that was kind of supposed to be his role. He was supposed to just be sort of like a, a reliable a reliable fragger that didn't actually have to go for crazy plays or initiative plays mm. or anything like that. But he almost over... I feel like he almost overperformed straight out the gate. Especially and now on he's CT kind of, side, right? Yeah. Yeah, especially especially on CT side. So now he's... So I, feel, I almost feel like he's regressing to what they had intended him to be at the start instead of where he's kind of set the expectation, right? I think he... He peaked too early, and so now he's he's maybe seeing a bit of a decline. Well, maybe not. I mean, not too early. He's won like two or three majors. Oh no, yeah, of course. He did peak for it was a long peak. It is a long (laughs) peak. Uh, I mean, one of the things that's been mentioned is the IGLing thing, and and I think that with Magisk, that might be a topic to actually maybe become more reality where. Look, he, he was IGLing for a while, and he was doing pretty well as an IGL, I feel like. Um, And then in December officially it went back to glaive we never know you'll never know what exactly went on there but officially it went back to glaive and since then other than the immediate first tournament like the first tournament right after he did amazing since then he's been having like this is borderline career worst form for all of 2021 Mm. and it i mean if he never turns it back around that really is something to consider about um star players igling um, because there are a few players that feel like they started IGLing and they never turned it, like came back to what they were. Um, and if it happens to Magisk, I'm not saying it definitely will, but if it does, then that's actually something to think about in, in terms of the way CS has played, who you want IGLing and all that type of thing. Well, I, I mean, I, people, okay, I feel like people almost forget that Tabson is an IGL for, for the longest time. Like he's, Fair, he was yeah. a star player at one point, right? And he, he kind of took the, he took that, dive in the valde approach yeah 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 and and it does it is going to be always a topic of conversation but i feel like he's almost overlooked so much on on the big roster and i think that's going to be something that ends up being i mean you're talking about magisk's uh sort of decline that could be something that he has to kind of fall into because he's still really really important uh to the big side for for on on inside of tabson um and he still has some really really big games but it's just you know far and few between 
I remember, I remember, um, so there was some Reddit post where it was like, if, if, if mouse sports is Nico sports, then ta- or uh, then big is tabs and international gaming. It's when okay. tabs and was just going absolutely ham, like game after game it's, after game. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably when winning. Keith is still on the roster or whatever. Right. Like, I think this is ago. like mid 2019, maybe okay. something like that. Um, early, uh, I can't remember exactly, but it was like this, this string of games where tabs was running unbelievably well. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he absolutely was carrying that roster, dude, like a new level at the time. Um, so yeah, there is, there is a point to be had about that as well. And he is kind of forgotten about in the annals of history. One of the things to mention about the EG Astrala series is obviously this is Oboe's debut. Now, just looking at the stats, maybe he wasn't, um, on for a shocker or on for the best performance of his life, but perhaps slotting in just fine to take him over the finish line. We didn't touch on Breeze departing because I don't think that had been announced when uh, we did the last show. So that that is a- almost its own kind of thing. Like how do we, uh, or no, was it, was it Breeze? It was Ethan, right? Let me just. Ethan, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, So we didn't, how do you say that guy's name backwards? Because he, he did do that ridiculous trend of, of spelling his name. Naughty. Like, like, Nate. Nate, yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, just ridiculous. Uh, not to be confused with Note, who you can check out on Twitter, at Note. Free shout out for him. But we do have obviously Obo coming in. Um, I don't know about hot, but it's he's been a while. It's cooled off, I would imagine, since his time in complexity. Now he's back and playing ESL Pro League. People were a little out on Obo because the reputation you get when you just abandon ship halfway through a tournament or or whatever it may be. Shout out Smuya. Shout out Smuya. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's the echoes of that. So people were out on him. They gave him a benefit of the doubt in so far as he he tried to give them time to find a replacement. He obviously had a, a very mature interview with the aforementioned note, in fact, over on HLTV. And aside from that, he was, he's very young. You know, it makes sense that he would be overwhelmed by a global pandemic in that sense. So we can't necessarily say that, like, lay all the blame at his doorstep, but now he's back and presumably back in Europe. I imagine there's, there's no like cross regional games happening right now. So kind of uh, interesting to, to have him back in, in a roster. And maybe this is the best one for him because it's unlikely that Liquid was going to open up a spot with Fallen taking the reins over there. So probably the best NA spot he could have, especially with all of the, a lot of the other NA teams bailing out from CS entirely. Do we reckon he'll find additional success? Because I'm not sure this is as much of like a slam dunk as people may have taken it to be. I don't know what the role overlap was between Ethan and Obo. Um, I'm, I'm kind of surprised actually that um, that's the player to go in that sense. But maybe at the same time they just need to shuffle things around and it does seem like eg needed a bit of a, a roster shuffle in that sense and maybe this is the way to do it just also shuffle some rolls around what, what do you guys make of this overall um well, I, I, sorry. sorry go ahead you yeah go no ahead. sorry I, I definitely think he's got, more likely to have a, a better start than jks did in in replacement of course for, yeah. for complexity um I, I think he's just he doesn't I don't think Oboe's style relies so much so on systems, just more so good like spatial awareness. The the guy is really uh, just has a knack for not only staying alive but catching you out weirdly enough. And I don't know if that's just a, a mental thing or it's it's predictive or how much prep work goes into that. But I I don't believe that it's going to be as uh, a difficult of an integrative step um, for Oboe to come in and already see success in in EG. Maybe it's Maybe it will be a while before we, we start to tout him as one of the stars in EG, because I think that's kind of how things were shaping out on, on complexity. But I, I do think in ter- if we're going to compare to his older roster, I don't think that he's going to have as many issues as JKS has had. I mean, I think he's been gone for, I'm looking like six months or so yeah. since his last top tier, like his last HLTV game. Um, and the fact that, I mean, he came in, he didn't do great on the first two maps, but I was watching on Inferno and he was looking pretty fire on Inferno at the very least. And okay. so if you can have one good map against Astralis, um, which is a team that I feel like often chews out and chews up and spits out young players for, and just eats them for breakfast. Um, oftentimes I feel like young star players do quite poorly against Astralis, at least the first few times they meet although i mean obo has met astralis before and come out the victor a couple of times um i mean the fact that he can have at least one good map is looking in my opinion i think that's looking up especially if you consider the first two maps are vertigo and nuke which might be maps that 
are a little bit more of a struggle to slot into a new roster on. Sure, yeah. Um and and he's done well on Inferno. I think I think Oboe's gonna gonna do quite well on this roster. I've got like I, I'm less confident about the EG roster and the players they already have on the roster than I am about Oboe doing, like, slotting in well. Like, I, I w- I'd feel less confident that Evil Geniuses does well than I am that Oboe does well. I just hope that he can find some stable ground because six months away from the game at a pro level is not a short amount of time, especially yeah, in the yeah. online era when there are so many games. So he's had quite a bit of downtime. Hopefully he can find stable footing and this team can, you know, get back up the rankings where some would say they quote unquote belong based on the investment that EG as an org has put in. But yeah. Oh, here's another sort of side tangent. I, I just uh, accidentally stumbled upon that one. It, the investment that EG has put on is perhaps considerable and th- this is a little week, couple weeks old news, but the I think it was the the chief, uh, it was some some chief higher up over at EG had a tweet out that was like, why are people questioning our involvement within CS:GO? It's very important to us, and uh, and of course there is so many responses to this one. What got me in particular was I think on, the, on by the numbers they covered this in particular and said something to the effect of like, yeah, I wonder why people would would question your involvement when like there's constant like industry rumors. Uh, from members of the organization talking about how they're like getting ready to sell this player to some Valorant squad or whatever. Like, and then of course that actually does happen finally. So uh, th- this is obviously a bit of a, a tangent, but do we think that EG are actually here to stay? Like, is this a legit thing? Do we, do we have to be yet another, uh, you know, group of industry pundits asking questions and causing tweets or, or what, what do you guys think? Is, is it, is it just absurd to even ask that? Are they certainly here or what do you guys, what do you guys reckon? I, I think it might have just been spread on by rumors, to be honest, just, just the fact that, I mean, you touch on the, the Valorant move and yeah. it being a real thing. Like players are also kind of in that talking point, right? They're, they're not going to be in talks with teams to, to do stuff like that. If they're, not considering it themselves as a player, right? I'm not going to play a game professionally that I'm I don't want to play for for any reason uh, other than other than maybe there's more money yeah. involved in that side. But it it's 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 just it does feel like a, a weird narrative to 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 push. I think if if an, if an organization says they're going to do something, I don't think there's really much we can dig into unless we actually have somebody on the inside being like, "Don't believe a word they say. Yeah, yeah. They 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 spread lies." Like I I don't think that uh, EG are going to go too far away. Um, I I would say that I think it's it's dumb for eg to have even said anything um it's like yeah i would be talking about it if they hadn't so yeah i mean (laughs) in in my opinion there's just so many people that have that have reiterated the same shit that's like i think sponge said it um thorn and richard lewis have said it i think they even came out on that by the numbers episode and were like more clear about it like they had kind of alluded to it and they were like no we're gonna say like outright here and and also it does actually make sense the the timelines kind of add up that ethan would go to valorant if you know near the end of uh, the end of 2020 eg was was um saying that they might um fall out of cs if they were saying that to it like if the players knew that and they didn't know what their future was going to be for a player on that roster or maybe even several to like go to valorant and start practicing a little bit because you're not sure what your future in cs is going to be mm-hmm. that would actually make a lot of sense with each with ethan end up ending up going over to valorant as well um i think it all kind of adds up and i think at this point when it comes to cs I feel like what happens, what might be happening is that in other, in other games, the org is usually believed. So they'll say this rumor is not true. And everybody's like, well, look, you fucking idiots. This rumor is not (laughs) true. But in CS, like every, it's gotten to the point where it's just every time it's this roster move is going to happen. No, it's not. Then it happens. Yeah, like it just course. happens so many times that it, people are kind of like over it, right? Yeah. So even if, honestly, even if EG is right that they never meant to leave, like they never had any plans to leave, even just denying it at this point, it just feels like orgs that deny it are. It feels like they're more likely to be lying than orgs that just don't say anything. I feel like sure. the orgs that know it's not true might not even be saying anything, and they're just like, "Look, this is not true. We know it's not true." Um. I don't think they're going anywhere now. Um, I would believe that they're they're not planning on going anywhere any uh, anywhere now, and that's probably why they came out about it because they were planning on they were looking at options, and now sure. they're not planning on leaving, and they want to be like, look, we're not planning on leaving. Don't not be fans of us, right? I, w- I would uh, guess that that's the way things are. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I guess I, it's, it's something that I know <laughs> that pe- people have had conversations with me about closed doors, just. Uh, 
the idea of the rumor mill being so accurate within our within our circuit that you basically take it as factual until sure. proven otherwise which is which is such a it's is weird because it does feel like other other sports or esports that very very rarely is the rumor mill true but the, i think the hit rate that we have in cs is just so high that yeah i, I guess i hadn't really considered that yeah you may you may have to take everything with that additional sort of a half kilogram of salt instead of just a yeah, pinch yeah. Fair enough. Well, I mean, org owners are also just they don't don't fucking help themselves. Like, if you just didn't make a point to lie about shit, yeah, like, and yeah. sometimes they just go way over the top, where it's like, don't believe these rumors; they're completely fabricated. Richard Lewis is a cunt. Like, and it's like, <laughs> what what was the last part added in for? Like, what was that was unnecessary? There's no need. And, then, and then it comes out true, and it's just like, fuck. <laughs> like, you really fucking hurt yourself on this one, man. Maybe just like stay out of it next time. <laughs> In a similarly veined tangent, I will ask now if anybody here has watched much Valorant at the professional level or played the game or anything. Any, any I'm, interactions? I'm I'm planning on making a Valorant YouTube channel. You know, we're we're going oh, okay. there. We're going we're going there. Okay, you know? perfect. Uh, it'll be it's interesting to get your input then. What, what do you what do you think, Yumi? Have you have you paid much attention to it? Uh, I paid a lot of attention at the start because I'm always interested in emerging esports and and whether they're I think that they're sound enough to continue as an esport by themselves fair enough um i i watched a lot of overwatch when it first started i thought it had a chance and then you know Rest organization decisions yeah i mean yeah. i i think that's just that's a whole blizzard thing that's a whole different kind of worms um but with valorant yeah i, I thought it was i thought the broadcasts were really entertaining and i actually really like the high amount of theory crafting that you can go in into that game especially with abilities being something that is ever emerging i hmm. you just look at the the korean scene and their their ability usage was just so far ahead of everybody else for a time now yes, everybody else yeah. is catching up and i don't know i like going on tangents about what the ideal and what the perfect setup for is for this particular side of the map and having that whole conversation the the talking points from an from an analysis point of view are almost feel never ending with with valorant at the moment and with more heroes to come, I can only expect that that continues. But I think that it's almost too much too quick, and I don't really like the direction the game's gone in general. I think it's it's far too cluttered. Even even if you are trying to appeal to a, a wider audience, sure. the, the knowledge the knowledge ramp up now is becoming more and more significant, and it's it's going to be harder for newer players to jump in. Similar to to a lot of mobas. Okay, fair enough. And here, so here's my my reason for bringing this one up is I we actually did chat about this briefly when Yumi was in the stream chat yesterday when Squid and I were doing some prep for what we casted today at the EDC. Mm -hmm. And one of the tangents I went on was bringing up a hilarious clip from Simple's stream where he played Valorant. And in this clip, just as a, a bit of a quick play by play on it, a red dot or flashlight or something flies over his head. He shoots it. And then he gets blinded by some like green goop that doesn't even like have the its UV configured correctly. So it just like clips through his head and stuff. And then after that expires, a dog runs across his screen, which he two taps. And then a player runs across the screen, which he kills. And then he dies and he just goes, what was that wolf? And it was like the funniest shit because I also don't know what happened, Simple. And if I don't know what happened and Simple doesn't know what happened, I think maybe there's a common denominator somewhere in between there. So, Vu, do you have any, any idea what might have been happening there? I think there's some new characters that have some weird shit going on. This is like, this has been my opinion since the start. Valorant on, on beta launch was a really good fucking game, in, in my opinion. Um, and I just feel like Riot is going to riot, and that what they're going to keep doing sure. is adding in new new gameplay mechanics, new characters, new agents, and it's going to get fun. <laughs> it's going to get really fucking annoying real fucking quick, um, and that's the way I see it. The one thing that's interesting about the Valorant community is like those. If you've seen the the videos by Richard Lewis on um, on, on the pro uh, players, yeah, pro yeah, yeah. players are yeah. soft. Some yeah. of those are fucking pathetic and some of them man. are xcs like, too i feel like yeah like some of icky. them are just oh they're just <laughs> pathetic like the shit that that these pros are complaining about and the shit that happens all the time is that pros will like they'll complain about something and then in and they'll be like listen I, 
And then they'll like in DMs or something, they'll be like, oh, I didn't mean for the community to go out. I didn't mean to make you lose your job. I was just <laughs> complaining. And it's just like, are you fucking dumb? Wait, no, I already know the answer to that. Yeah, you are yeah. fucking dumb thinking that this was going to have no repercussions on the caster. Like, it, it, dude, it's pathetic, man. Some of the shit is, is just fucking sad. I just can't, I can't believe humans are like this. And they're just like, <laughs> somehow they don't, don't think that there's repercussions. To, like, they're just like, oh, I just wanted that not to happen again. It's like, just fuck off, dude. Just fuck right off. <laughs> Get out of my face. Well, this is a, a topic near and dear to, to both of our hearts, that all three of mm. our hearts, because as, as broadcast talent, member of talent, and analysts, would-be analysts, right, in my case anyway, what, what, what do we make of this one, Yubi? Do you, do you feel a personal, like, maybe uh, soul connection to some of these Valorant color commentators who have been called out for saying things like, this player is not playing very well right now? Um, I think I... There's a, there's a weird angle where I'll, I'll side with the player a little bit. I, I do think... At the start of the the broadcast, especially analysts, I feel like they'd go out of their way to be more provocative or try and have a hot take or try okay. and just push the commentary a little bit too far, push the analysis too far, just for the sake of being contrarian. And I I, I don't know that I'm a huge fan of that in particular. And I, I think that I think Soulcast was actually one of the players, and he's he's UK based. That that's that's that whole liquid journey that they they've been on. Um, in a lot of respects, because these these are newer teams, it's a newer game. Th being signed with big organizations, in particular, is something that is maybe new experiences for the players. So it could be just like knee jerk reaction. You know, you're trying to effectively compromise my my line of work, or, or, or trying to angle in as uh, I should be removed from a team. And they may have just been on this grind that I that I know that the the UK guys have had that where they have been playing for like four or five years, maybe more and not been a part of large organizations like it. So I, I can understand why there, there would be pushback, but at the same time, I think as a player, you just need to be able to separate from what your job is and what the commentator's job is and just be able to, to move past it. I don't think you have to come out and be like, oh, I have to. I feel I have to defend myself. It just sure. it pro prove, it in the, prove it in the fucking server, right? I mean, you shouldn't be watching back the fucking broadcast to begin with. This is like step one. Why the fuck are you well, watching Well, there's no back? demos, well, they dude. Have to. Well, they Riot have has to. no oh, demos, they, no dude. Demos. Riot oh, doesn't man. know how to make a game, man. Oh, sh oh it's Riot Games. Oh, no, yeah. oh man, no wonder they're watching I actually, I completely oh, forgot shit. there was no demos. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. you shouldn't, I, if, if anything, you should be watching it back on mute. I mean, sure, you, just, yeah. you don't need the input of, of these people. And if there is anything valuable that they're, they're having as input as like potential um, changes, someone should inform you that there's something valuable that they've said and you can watch that like i don't yeah, think you sure. need to be watching in and I, I i do have some sympathy in that like you're right you know a lot of these players are players that haven't been under that level a level of scrutiny or spotlight yeah. in in other games and, and they're they do see it as like a potential attack on them but at the same time like you just got to understand that you're like a professional and, and you know i think cs has got to the point at least where it's you know you don't see this type of thing unless it's egregious um, and even those ones, like the the fallen versus similar thing, it was similar, right? I think it was. What did um, he say? I, what was the what was the? Well, comment? that was the one where he. Um, I think it was similar. Said like, "Well, they're just not as hungry anymore." And then fallen. Oh yeah, that, yeah. And then right? Thorin's response is, right? "Then why are you shit or something?" Yeah, <laughs> something <laughs> yeah I mean, to, to some extent, like there is a level yeah. of like, then why? The, <laughs> I, I've always disagreed with that, like that logic. Well, if you put in so much effort, then why are you shit? Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Sometimes, like, there's gonna be peaks and valleys sure. in your in just how good you. Even if you're putting in ten hours a day every day for for two months. One day you're going to be better. One day you're going to be worse. And and for me, like I, I've played games for you know years where I've played CS for you know there was maybe two three years where I played it like ten hours a day. And you know I've had I've had two three month periods where I've been like unbelievably good compared to my average, and then I've regressed to average or below average. And it's not because I was putting in less effort. It's just the human fucking condition. You're not always going to be consistent. Um, but at the same time, like I think CS players have gotten to a level where it's just like yeah, we just don't. We're, we're not listening to that because I don't want that outside input. I don't want to get in my own head about like yeah. what other people think I'm doing. If I think I'm doing a good job, then I'm doing a good job. And if my players agree, then I'm not going to get cut. And maybe they'll even say positive things in interviews. You know, they've got to get to that point. Um, and, and just the problems I've had are 
there have been some egregiously like trivial ones. Like I know there was one that became like a Twitter dispute from Australia yeah. where they deleted each, the tweets because someone was like, Oh, I haven't heard of this team before. And apparently that was too big of a dig. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> it, it gets like, it gets to a pretty ridiculous point. Like I know there was one time um, where my, I, I like tried to build up a broadcast by being like, well, let's look at like, like this, let's see if this was, um, a fluke that they beat this other team or if it was actually you know they can build on that and it's like a really good thing and that was i, I can never tell like this guy mentioned it to me and he's like calling us a fluke and i'm like i couldn't tell if he was joking or not because if he wasn't joking i'm like dude come on i'm just building the the this narrative of the broadcast but if he was joking that would be like more normal like that, that's the type of thing i've seen in valorant where it's just like oh you said it was a fluke oh oh let me just post that on twitter <laughs> analysts so calling stupid. things a, a fluke you should understand <laughs> the game better like fuck <laughs> it's yeah, that, just dumb that, man that that australian one is is weird because i know in cs uh, especially in, in, until you're breaking into tier one that that commentary will follow you throughout unless you've you're sure. hitting tier one events all, pretty consistently like oh yeah we would we didn't even consider them contenders you know the they, they shouldn't be able to beat this team yada 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 and so that's that, even that, reflective that... of the storyline of the match too isn't it because you're yeah. you're you're trying to be entertaining on a broadcast when you're commentating but you're also trying to tell an accurate story and when you say stuff like you know like there's there's obviously one of the subjects of the previous episode of this talk show was of course the snow sweet snow broadcast and one of the things that i took issue with that was obviously not related to any of like the moral gray area stuff or the way that they handle things is just some of the some of the analysis is just wrong where they say stuff like copenhagen flames is one of the best teams in the world like that's a literal quote by the way so like you know that's stuff i'm not going to call people out by name but come on man like you got to be honest with it right so you can't just say like if somebody did that equivalent in valorant about some australian team they've never heard about then yeah you're not gonna like that's not even true right so like, the idea that oh yeah i know all about this team that's even maybe a more egregious in that sense because you're supposed to be the authority it's actually better to say something to the effect of i've never seen this team before we got to see what they're made of and you can spin it a couple of different ways as a color commentator but you're not gonna come out and sit and try to make some shit up on the fly just spin a wheel real quick and come up with some quotable moment like that's that, that isn't a reasonable thing to say you got to hype people up in a reasonable way and you got to be able to essentially set the viewer's expectations almost and i think it makes perfect sense to say no idea who these guys are they certainly don't you know maybe they don't have even have that much information for you to look at a demo like earlier today i casted a romanian team that just came in their first official match was what i casted and i said yeah that should be a 2-0 because these guys have done nothing in previous teams and we have no reason to think otherwise maybe they can surprise us and that's kind of how i obviously i was a little bit yeah. more verbose than that but that's how i set it up and that's how you do it so yeah and you you also have to approach it from the from the mind of a viewer as well like sure, somebody's yeah. watching a lot of tier one broadcasts consistently and then just uh, peering into to some lower rungs then you you get a team that has no match history as far as you can tell on on whatever resources you're able to get right. information on then then you're never going to be able to to spin a story that's like oh yeah i could see them t winning this because i've watched all of their demos and i've run uh deep analysis because there's so many games going on all of the time you almost have to come at it from a, a still an, an analytical point like you could still break down the game in inside of it and be like oh they're surprising me very early with how well they're playing things out but the the, the opening narrative can, should always be what everybody else's uh what everybody else with reasonable amount of time could look into and i think maybe that was one of the the highlighted things from that that australian controversy thing that you were talking about in valorant vu is that it didn't seem like the these commentators had done the reasonable reasonable amount of research to look into these teams, which is why I think people had so many issues with this. Like, you need to do your job as an analyst or a commentator to to at least look at the past results and have to, at least given a, a cursory glance to all of the 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 play styles and things that they they do. Otherwise, you're you're basically just lie. You're not lying, but you're just making a lot of assumptions about how anything is going to go if there is. Uh, if their resources are available to you to to find out how good a team is yeah i think there's 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 a level of you've got to be reasonable about it especially if you just haven't had time to put in enough research because i think hmm. especially when it comes to valorant uh, there's a lot of teams that aren't all that well known and so you have to put in a certain amount of research to find them but then if you're casting 10 games in a day or you know like 10 hours then you don't really have the time to find the information. And that's where it really opens you up. And that's why it's really unfortunate that, you know, a, a lot of the tier two, tier three casters are kind of overworked 
because they're the people that people sure. are going to be more comfortable attacking for not knowing what oh, they're yeah, talking about. Sure. Especially yeah. players right? but, as well, yeah. Yeah, but they're, they're also given less ability to do the research. If I'm doing two best of threes today, I can do good research on that. If I'm doing four best of threes today, I'm doing mediocre research, if that, on all four teams, right? Like you just can't mm -hmm. put in that much that much research, especially if there's like an open qualifier or something, you don't know the teams. And yeah, like as a person on broadcast, you have to be reasonable about it and you have to be, to, you, people don't like admitting it, like I haven't done my research, right? But you have sure. to kind of allude to it at least that you, you know, you yeah. haven't been able to look into the team enough. If you're just trying to say like they're complete unknown, uh, like onliners or complete nobodies or something, there, there, there is ways to frame it that do just look bad. And it's just like, doesn't, doesn't say good things about you if you haven't done the research. Um, it's yeah, just like a matter holding of up a Kappa sign. I hear that's a bad take. I mean, that's a can kind of ruin you, careers. Yeah, you, you just you have to be reasonable about it. You know, you just that's that's all you have to do. And then you, the players have to be reasonable about it because I don't think the players see the same thing. Where it's like, you know, I've had complaints about broadcasts in in, in the past personally, and then you know, when as soon as I thought about it for a minute, like, dude, these guys are working like fourteen hour days for like the last two weeks. Like, uh, do they really have time to look into something that I've spent like a day looking into? I don't have time for that, right? So, to some extent everyone's got to try and be as reasonable as possible and then try and deal with things, you know, if possible behind closed doors, because I don't, I don't know when the community get, when the community gets involved, it's just, it's a matter of like, what's the most inflammatory title possible. Sure, yeah. And that's what they're running with, you know? And I think the big thing is if you don't know, don't say anything, anything like, authoritative. If, if yeah. Yeah. Besides yeah, saying yeah, that you don't, don't know in some broadcast appropriate way. Right. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, Exactly. You just have to find a way to to frame it that is, you know, I I I gave it I gave it a look, didn't find too much. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, so I don't go. think you have to go much further than that. But maybe some some will uh, have some issue with not being seen as the the authority the the authority on on the broadcast, so to speak. Yeah, there might be a bit of compensation there. But before we move on from this topic, a very loose connection is when I brought up the Kappa face, obviously referencing Dust. I have to say, like, there was this ridiculous tweet that Harry threw out that I'm not sure was it calculated. You never know with casters, okay? Like that maybe that's the title of this show, actually. You never know with casters. You never know what what they're what they're really at. But he did have a seemingly harmless tweet where he said, I have not casted Counter-Strike in a while, and I am physically turning to dust. And I didn't want to say it. Somebody else already said it. Somebody said, if you know, you know, as a reply. And that got a like, man. That's all I could say. Like, come on. It's just too perfect. You can't say, you can't just frame it that way. <laughs> Although, at the same time, it's not even accurate because he was casting EPL. So, he's doing all right. He's yeah, do Dustin Vince seemed to have been doing... I'm in his Discord and he adds everyone all the time when he get, okay. does casting and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. So, you just wake up like in a cold sweat, a like Discord work. notification, and then you just see <laughs> at everyone, just, fuck! Like, God, I'm in way too many Discords, man. Yeah. But Dust, I actually... He 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 asks everyone when he puts up a nice little new disc, disc golf video, <laughs> you know, when when he streams. Like I've chilled in this stream a couple times, okay. you know, sure. um, and it seems like I've gotten a lot of notifications that he's doing EPL and and like yeah. all this other shit recently. So it seems like he's doing decently well, you know. Um, hopefully, Dust seems like a nice guy. I I like Dust. Um, I actually so think he you know, is criminally like under, not even underrated, just like shat on for no reason. So I do feel mm -hmm. slightly guilty about like piling on with stuff like that. But at the same time, I'm also a proponent of him. I like him. So maybe I, maybe that gives me some some ability to. I don't know. Whatever. He's he's dealt with far worse from people far bigger than I. So I I doubt that it matters too much for him. But I think he's been doing pretty good work. Vincent Dust underrated duo. I don't know why they don't get more work. Actually, I do know why, but I can't say on broadcast. And we'll move on from that. So <laughs> jumping straight in. Um, actually, talking about broadcast, obviously, Yumi, you've been casting, like we talked about earlier, at the very top. Uh, Blast premier qualifiers. Have mm -hmm. anything anything sort of stood out to you in your casts so far? Um, I mean, not particularly. A lot of the, the favorites for the tournaments have, have con gone through. I think there's, there's maybe, with the exception, I, I did a... I did the opening day of the Middle Eastern, um, uh, the Mesa region, and okay, it was a long day. It was ten hours, so it was or ten best of ones rather, so more than. Um, wow. But the the favorite team, so to speak, didn't win, and I guess that was that was the only real surprise. I I also think that um, when we looked at the Iberian side, the the fact that 
Movistar just didn't look that good in the finals was really, really confusing. Um, which I guess would maybe lead us into to talking about Movistar and, and that whole project because yeah, sure. you know, Smuya and everything. Um but they, they, they felt a saw, which isn't exactly like the, the easiest team to move past, but they, it almost felt like they were supposed to win it so many I could times agree with in the that, series, yeah. and then they just didn't. What do you make of, of Smuya on Movistar Riders, Vu? You talked about this yeah, before we went yeah. live, actually. Yeah, I said it before before we went live. Um, before he got officially picked up to the team, it looked like he was doing really well. And since he's been picked up to the team officially, it, it has felt like he's not been doing quite as well. I looked at the stats, and statistically, he's just seems a little bit more inconsistent than usual. Um, it's just I think it's just happened to be that pretty much all the games I've caught of him have been him on the bottom of the scoreboard somehow, um, which... Again, I did speculate it could be that they were like, look, we'll we'll pick you up, but you got to buy into the system, and maybe that could have caused some problems. But that's something I'm going to have to do a little bit more research into because it's also just very possible that I've only looked into the games where he's been having a really bad performance, sure. and that's just, you know, kind of unlucko that I've looked only at those games. Um, uh, I would, I would Unlucko like you... your PC restarting in the end of the match. Ah, <laughs> oh, geez, so unlucky. <laughs> that, that, okay, to be fair on that one, to be fair on that one. Okay, let's hear it. When you read it back knowing that he did say GG and then, and then disconnected, it was clearly a joke. Like, when you read it back, having known he said GG, then disconnected, that tweet is clearly like Are you sure? that's something, is that, this that's is an some, argument I haven't heard before. That's something you would say. Okay, like like if I fucking rage quit my stream and I like <laughs> fucking slam my mouse and like hit my monitor and then I come back like I've done this before is, uh, in a different way, but if I did that and then the the okay. like and then the stream shut off and I came back and I'm like, "Oh, sorry guys, my computer restarted." Right? Like that's obviously not <laughs> real. Sure, yeah, like yeah. obviously that's not what happened. And I've done the same thing like the joke I have on my stream is like I'll whiff really horribly. I'll whiff really horribly and then I'll just be like Oh guys, oh I just blacked out. Like what happened? Like I just I can't yeah, remember. What, can someone tell me what yeah. happened there, right? Like and so with that like context that he did say GG and then leave, it's obvious that his computer didn't restart. Well, we and know so, that it was not yeah. the case. But what gets yeah, me yeah. is like it, it does with look with that like, in mind. Okay. With that in okay. mind is all I'm saying. Like yeah. if he's thinking, well, I said GG. Like everyone knows, but not everyone can see that unless you go into the actual demo. It, it kind of makes sense. It's I I can't really go either way on this one. It, he could have been trying to mislead people. It would, if you think sure. of it from like one perspective, it makes sense that he was joking and he would think people knew he was joking. Yeah. On the other hand, he could have been just misleading people. It's hard to say. Yeah. It kind of it almost looked like he he tried to bluff everybody and then he got called out on the bluff. To be honest, that's, that's, yeah, what, it, very that's what it looks very like to me as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's very important we get we get some sort of consensus going here because this is probably the most important aspect of breaking down Mavi Star Riders is whether or not uh, Smuya is able to have a functioning PC for those <laughs> comebacks in OT. <laughs> but fair enough. So you you were saying earlier, Vu, that you, you you've seen some hallmarks of just bad performance. Was it just was he playing similar spots to what you were used to and just not hitting shots? What what were some symptoms of his when he was playing poorly? I think. <sighs> Smoothie has been a little bit inconsistent at times, sure. um, historically, where he's just like, I think it's part of the attitude um, where it's just like, he's going to make his plays and they either work or they don't. And sometimes they're just not working and he's still there doing it, which is different from JW. I don't know why I bring up JW, but for okay. example, JW, he's got his play style and it's like, it, hopefully it works. And if it doesn't work, he's like, guys, Olaf, take the op. Or like, well, back in the day, Olaf, take the op. Like, I'm not offing anymore. <laughs> yeah, just passes uh, it to FaZe Clan. Yeah, yeah, give I me a shotgun. Give me a shotgun. I'm going to go to drop. I'm going to go to drop on Cobble and uh, you guys can op. Like, you know, okay, that, that's, I think that's a hallmark. I mean, a hallmark of a good opera is being able to adjust, right? Like having a play mm -hmm. style, it doesn't work. You can play a different way. But a hallmark of a mentally sound human being is that if you don't have a, uh, if you don't Jesus. have the ability to adjust, at least you can drop the op and be like, "Look, it's not working. Someone else take this over. I'll rifle." Right? I don't think Smoothie is there as a human, so he's got to get there as a player. <laughs> so he's got to get there as a player. All right, that's all I'm saying. The hallmark what? of a mentally sound human is not being Smoothie. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> it's just like you know if. If you don't have a if you don't have another gear with your gun with your op, then okay. you gotta have another gear as a human being, right? Okay. Uh, 
<laughs> what do you think? I don't think I, I don't think I'd go that far, man. <laughs> um, I'm just saying, like JW did it. <laughs> JW does it. If he's not, if it's not happening, and he knows that he's that doesn't have another gear, he's just like, take the op. A rifle, I can have confident. It's also different if you're just not confident, like you're not confident with a rifle. You know, that's it's yeah, also I, different. Sure. I, I think I think that is something I can maybe a counterpoint to because we, we saw him in the I, I saw him in the finals yesterday, and he he was picking up the rifle more, and I think that was mainly because of buying decisions and patterns that the, that they were gonna do, especially on CT side, um, on the side of Movistar, and he didn't look out of place on the rifle. I actually think his opening was a little bit more of a question because. Like you were saying, he would get maybe he would think about doing a play. He'd do the play, and then it would either work or it didn't. And very often, it was either completely mitigated by them not hitting its bomb site, or you know, just um, good utility by by saw. Or he that there's there's like one moment that stands out in my head, and I'm sure it's something that he's probably replayed over a few times in his in his own. Um, is where they I think they were in like a three v two. And he's got like a perfect like he's flanking well not flanking but he's he's not been cleared in an angle with an AWP and he's trying to line up this player like his his teammate just died and he's he's wavering like uh and then he misses and that's that's not something that I would attribute to to Smuya altogether and the fact that it looked like nerves got to him in a finals moment for for a qualifier for a much bigger tournament it did seem to sort of weigh in and I I I am worried I think that that could be like a confidence shaking thing because it did take him a long time to to find a kind of find a place back into a roster effectively and so being being someone that he's he's always kind of been a big proponent of himself being a being a star opera and I think that that confidence is is great to have as a player but if he does effectively bottle it here with Movistar then I I don't know that another team will touch him so I, I think that's that's that big worry mm. and maybe that, that that's where the nerves come from that shooting someone in the back thing really is where nerves come in because someone moving completely randomly and you're aiming at when the they back, have no it's, idea. Like, yeah. it's like, don't fuck this up. Just as soon as that thought comes in your mind, though, where it's like, I can't miss this, you, you're always going to miss it. Like, you will 100% <laughs> yeah. miss that shot if you've thought to yourself, fuck, I can't miss this shot. And that's where, like, even if, like, even in, like, just shitty fucking pugs that I'm in, I'll be, like, I'll be, like, sh aiming at someone in the back, and it's, like, I'm having a bad game. Please, please. Don't just, like, they're all right. watch. They're all watching. <laughs> just please don't <laughs> fucking miss this. Like, please. And then it's just, like, up. Oh, Miss the shot, and then it's just, I'm just like waiting to die at that point. I'm just like, fuck that's my what, life, just get that's me. That's where the oh, I blacked out part comes in. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, the yeah, there it is. Guys, I blacked out. What happened? <laughs> I, just, I don't remember, man. Fuck. Well, there you go. Maybe that's why Vu is such a like a proponent of Smuya. Like Vu is the guy who's restarting his PC, quote unquote, <laughs> and and blacking out in the middle of his game. And Smuya is the one who's just PC crashes as as he types GG like that. Maybe, maybe there's some similarities, some some love lost between the two there. Could could be the connection. So what do we make in so? Okay, here's another question. Then you talked about Saw earlier, and I'm not sure Vu. Have you seen anything to do with Saw? I've seen the player saw, but the team I've Fair not enough. seen very much of. Okay. All right. Well, we'll, we'll briefly touch on this here because Squid and I have casted mm -hmm. saw quite a few times in ESEA premiere. And we always find it a challenge to cast a team named saw with a member, a player named just, I actually just despise casting that team because it cu cuts out it, it, it's such a challenge to form a sentence because I, I can be like, we've just seen, Oh, I can't say saw right now. Fuck. What do I say? We've just seen the other team do this. You know what I mean? Like you can't I, you can't say saw after you just say C or we see saw. I, I mean or... you can. I mean people oh, are gonna can. make that association because it's just a thing that, that that has to happen. It's it exists. It's like saying that's a big round from big. Like yeah, you can yeah, say yeah. that. You can get away with it because it it, it, this is where the memes true. come in, man. This yeah. is where the memes come in. Or it's like we 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 see saw here, just man. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, just... getting frags left and right, going up and down. Saw is yeah. they see they seem so positive. You know, it just <laughs> this one's been a seesaw rocking back and forth. Yeah, you, you really could have like a Reddit worthy yeah. moment just saying see saw just. <laughs> up and down, like just up and down, le like you know, balance, you know, leverage. You just hope for a team kill so that when Muterus gets a team kill, it's mutiny for Muterus. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs>
Whatever. I don't know if that's a Reddit moment. I think going on about see and saw and just like okay, okay, okay. For, you're trying for to a full you're, phrase. You're, you're crafting to try and get the upvotes here at the moment. Yeah, yeah, Listen, yeah. man. This well, is, what, this is what being a YouTuber is about, dude. Yeah. Like, dude, you remember when we were talking about doing taxes before the show started? And he's like, clickbait moments was one option on his fucking tax. <laughs> well, that's one of them right there. Now you know why. <laughs> that's why he gets the content paid the brain. Yeah, I just don't have the content brain. I guess. <laughs> I am I, notoriously I, I, bad at like handling anything related to Twitter or whatever. I just like, fuck it. So what were you what oh, were yeah. you gonna say on Saw now that we've um, actually gotten I, through their name? Yeah, it was weird because we we talked um we, we got to see Stadoto not orping or like not being a primary orp on Vertigo one time. And I actually think that Saw are trying to undergo a, a bit of a stylistic shift and maybe move Stadoto to being more of a rifling influence and just okay. play positional orping as opposed to trying to have him be a star sure um because i think they tried this the star line effectively for stododo for quite some time and it's 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 yeah yeah it's been it's been a big part of their their success as of late but also i think a part of the reason why they lose uh to teams that they shouldn't sometimes so it, it, it looked looked like a stability shift but then when we went to the finals he was back to just being an orper and and kind of dominating um so i don't know how much of that is is true or because we it was in a i think it was in a group stage game where we saw him not opening and then when we went to the that is just something they do though especially on vertigo t side i mean some teams never break out the awp on no, t on side, CT but... side oh on ct side as well yeah okay that's a little yeah. bit different because Stadoto usually does break out the awp there but they almost mm -hmm. never go for secondaries which is like a staple of most teams and they almost never go for it on t side as well so it's it is a little peculiar that they've regressed even further away from that and just trying to go maybe they think it's like 2016 and thorin's telling them to play five rifles because that was the thing that he was on about for a while he said that was like the best way to do it and just only op occasionally um now that's obviously yeah, just seemingly not the case so but yeah, just was opening inside on CT side, and it was just mm. it was strange. It it looked like they they were trying to do a thing, but they they weren't comfortable enough in it yet to do okay. it in the finals type of yeah. thing, which is could be interesting to track further in. Yeah, yeah, something to, something to keep track of. <laughs> As if you have to have an excuse to say the word just more frequently. Now he's opping and and maybe even a highlight player as well after this. Yeah. Just ingest. I will ingest that joke ingest bro not ingest <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> i mean you could it's hard to read i mean you only said it as a, yeah, as see, a no, listen. i'm just saying i'm just saying you know you could you could really go you could you could script out some real shit to, to saw and all these other shitty names they are shitty what, what's the what's the best name you casted in the qualifier yumi best player name best team name what do you think any anything oh my stand God. out now you're now you're really quizzing me my memory is not good well um, what, what's just one that comes to mind though you don't have to go look it up or whatever but uh maybe nacho nacho okay yeah i was, I was really waiting for for a round where he just like completely surprised the other team it's like that's not your round and i was thinking <laughs> gonna kind of go with that um but it never happened you know we just the cheese man um well, I have I, we had like I have never heard of him, and I've been casting at the like the tier two, tier three level for a while. So maybe that's why it never happened. He might just be bad. I'm just speculating. <laughs> Don't know anything. One about of these him, yeah. things that all these fucking shitty NA little cut kids do. Okay, <laughs> they're okay, the little fucking nice. cut kids in NA. Do. We've got they aggro these, boo now. <laughs> they they have these like these like it's they're troll like anime names. Oh, like yes. okay, so there's someone along I know with their named, profile pictures. Of there's course. someone I know named Rin. And he yeah. had he's playing advanced this season, and he's on an alt. And the name of his alt is Noya. That, that's okay. like the name of his alt. And it's like when you have a team full of names like that, and, and people do this all the time. They like for for some reason they love fucking playing on alts, and they'll go into alts, and then I'll be I'll be paid to cast because their opposing team has a has an org, yeah. but their team is just fucking joke names like <laughs> that are unpronounceable just ridiculous like just like is that some why they teams have you? like they have like a sentence as their name it's just like what the <laughs> fuck am i doing right now man it's ridiculous okay hit us for what's the sentence it was there I, I don't know i can't i can't i can't come okay. up with any like real examples real or... examples yeah, yeah, yeah. uh i just know that it happens a lot and it's fucking ridiculous <laughs> The, the little things the my pet peeve me. my pet peeves man my yeah. pet peeves it, it's it's people with ridiculous anime names on alts and reddit threads about useless grenades those are views the way in I, exactly i think to add on to that if you're a player that's looking to try and make it and you're not sticking to your alias all the way through you're just an idiot by the way yeah. if, like if you have a sick round you're just I, I don't i don't care if you're getting a 3k under the the guise of some 
random joke name that you made up that was funny with your friends. Like, yeah. I, I don't I don't care for it. I, there could be anybody behind that. Sure. Fair enough. It feels like we are uh, perhaps coming to a bit of a closing moment. So we should probably talk a little bit about something a little bit more notable in the scene to close things out. The only problem is, as I keep saying this, um, don't actually know what is notable. We talked about ESL. I was, I was hoping something would pop into my head. I guess we could just talk about nades again, like Vu. <laughs> Vu, Vu can talk to us about nades. Can you just talk about your video? Can you just actually play your video for the whole rest of the uh, It's a 15-minute video, you know? Yeah, it's, uh, it doesn't. It, I don't think it fits into the, to the flow of a, of a podcast <laughs> yeah, very well. Sure. Sure enough. So was there something that you research when you were researching, you saw like some groundbreaking nade? Is there like a clickbait nade you can talk about that will get people to click on that video? Most the useful whole video, nade? The, the whole, whole video is what should be on the top of Reddit. Okay. It's not. Okay. That's the clickbait. That's the clickbait angle. It should this is this is the type of video that should have ten thousand upvotes, but okay. it's gonna get like two hundred probably max. Right. Top on the yeah. list of videos Reddit doesn't want you to see. Yeah, there you go. Reddit doesn't want you to see that. They want you to see like useless smokes that you can throw well, into like a is, trash can on Dust2 from Inferno. Reddit also does hate Reddit more than anyone else. Like it's it's <laughs> like Rick and Morty where it's like Ricks hate themselves the most. That's Reddit. Reddit okay. hate Redditors hate themselves the most, but not themselves. <laughs> because if you ever say Reddit has this opinion, they go, well, there, excuse me, but there's a million people that go on this Reddit. <laughs> yes, every and, single one of them says say, exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> are you trying to say that this is a million people's opinion? Because you know, there are different people on this forum on a daily basis. And it's like, yeah, man, this fucking post with 100,000 upvotes is definitely not indicative of the way the community sees things at all. It's definitely a totally different 100,000 people the next day. Listen, all right? Reddit hates themselves the most, okay? This is the, the, the moral of the story. Well, hey, I will. I have something to, to report. I've just checked Reddit, which is why my face is paler than insert. I just say British players' names. I'll say Smuya. Uh, a nade video <laughs> worth bookmarking by Vu is currently at the front page of Reddit. Insofar as it's just at the bottom, it's the bottom most entry on the front page. So See, it should be at the top. That's it should be. Yeah, it's just mm -hmm. inverse. So if you guys can fix that for us, <clears throat> there you go. I, I I guess. I mean, but what are your guys' opinions on the? Is it like? Is it the new? Mad Lines roster? Oh, there you go. That's a that's a play that we could talk about. I think, okay. I talked about this on stream as well, and Yumi okay. remembers this, but I haven't told Vu about this. Waro 2K is one of the players who was announced to this roster. And Waro 2K has a very hilarious clip that is circulating around right now, or was like months ago. Um, he, he previously stood in for Forza back when they were still making roster moves. So that's why the only reason why I know him, but he has this clip on Mirage where he is, is fully zoomed in and um, a player sort of walks in front of him and he fires, but it's only noticeable with X-ray. He shoots and it looks super suspicious and everybody's like, what the fuck? Accusations flying left, right and center. So Waro 2K responds because sort of like the EG point where you just shouldn't respond and just let it like sort of blow over. Uh, Waro 2K doesn't know that. So he responds and here's his story. Apparently he was trying to kill a fly in his room and that's why he accidentally left clicked on somebody's head through x-ray uh, with obviously the, the bullet didn't even hit. It was one of those like meme things where you see like the first time overwatchers and the overwatch comes in and, and you're watching the, them and they, they don't know that you can't wall bang through a certain surface. So they're just sat there like, like it's 1.6 or something, just trying to wall bang op or, or like auto or something. That's exactly what it looked like for Waro. So it, it does beggar belief that like a professional tier player or an FPL player would not know that that's something you can wall bang, whatever. Either way, it's, it is ridiculous to say that a fly was in my room. So I almost headshot a guy through a wall. But there you hey go. Man, That's the only reason shit I know. happens. All right. Here's here's the one thing that annoys me about like a lot of those videos where sure. people think that they're looking through walls. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. A good portion of them, the data isn't given back to the original player. They're too far away, and and nobody yes, thinks yeah, about yeah, that. Go. Where it's like this guy, literally, if he was walling, he would not see this person, and people don't like realize that somehow. And so like a lot of them do end up being like. Dude, even if he was walling, this is not someone he could even see. Fair I don't enough. know if that's the case here, though. But I, I think there's that that additional layer to the conspiracy as well. Where, I mean, hypothetically, if somebody could relay inf or get that information when they shouldn't, right by an ESP, that it's not outside of the question that you could maybe link multiple different uh, player perspectives and then you know compile 
that all into the the data okay. but then people complain about running a google chrome tab in the background <laughs> as as an fps drop so i'm gonna have this thing that is hyperlinked to all four of my teammates so that we can all cheat effectively like i think i don't think that's plausible because i think people are sure. too like performance focused to even consider something like that like it has to be it would have to be absolutely flawless zero impact on the game type of thing if, if people really wanted to get away with it and I just don't think that's that's ever really going to be the case. I'm not saying that, of course, that sure. that couldn't be a possibility, but it is still very like I don't think people even run that through their heads when they're thinking up these like crazy, crazy ways in which like, this, these players or teams could be cheating. I feel like it is a little bit concerning that like no, even tier two or three players have been caught for cheating since everything's been online. Like I don't think a lot of people are going to cheat. But I think there's always going to be someone that's going to cheat. Oh, yeah. And the fact that nobody's been caught is a little bit concerning because I feel like there's got to at least have been one or two people that cheated. Like they was forsaken. Can't, we, <laughs> we can't have gone through a whole online era and nobody cheated. There's no Only way. Only 37 just, coaches. I, yeah, other than the coaches. <laughs> there's yeah, no they, way. There was no well, that's, that's even that more one. proof. That's even more proof. Like, the fucking yeah. coaches were cheating out the ass, and they're supposed to be fucking upstanding citizens. Vores even brings them in to mentor their fucking school, right? Like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that a real they're, they're supposed. They're supposed to be morally upstanding citizens, and they're the ones that have all been caught, but nobody else has been caught for cheat. I just feel like... There's got to be someone. There's no... I mean, I know Droid got banned from Face It. I don't know if he got unbanned yet. If he is not unbanned and he actually was cheating, that's the only one. I feel like that can't be the only one. There's got to be someone. It would It would be fitting. if it, He's an NA FPL player, right? Like, Yeah. yeah it there's would a be, reason Dan M's back. That's all I'm saying. There's okay, a reason. okay. Dan M's there's, the it's savior. Not, it's not a coincidence. The return of the king. He's he's come back to, to right the wrongs, right the ship. Well, I don't know. Yeah, the the whole cheating thing is like a crazy conspiracy. Like as as Yumi mentions, like obviously Vax sucks is like sort of uh, lurking the elephant in the room, perhaps. But for this conversation, they have some pretty hilarious takes. I guess maybe they've actually been a little bit less funny than um, what I'm used to, because the last couple of times I have looked at them, it's it's actually just like almost like sad. Like oh, you guys are like this is yeah, this isn't even like, funny. Yeah, you guys are just I serious. I remember at like the start, like I think even before I got into to commentary, I mm -hmm. I used to to run this little game where I would justify the clip to the people effectively. Okay. And like try and explain it in in a way that is logical and like with sure. reason. And it it would hit with some people be like, oh yeah, that makes sense, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was just like, why am I putting so much effort into trying to educate people that don't want to be educated effectively? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. these people, like they're. If you're if you're kind of circulating in that in that circle, you're you're creating that that echo chamber for yourself and trying to trying to shout back when somebody's screaming a little louder is is you know the echo is going to be that much harder to to read into. So I I tried it for a time and I'm like yeah this is this is redundant. It's not going to get through to people. I don't think. One of the things, so you obviously, we, we opened this topic up by talking about Mad Lions, and we obviously haven't actually touched on their <laughs> roster. Yeah, I know. Um, we kind of diverted a little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just coming back here before we close out the show, I, I would say Kubin is probably, like, it's weird to say that the coach is the best prospect, but I think he might be. I don't know too many of the other players, to be fair, but he's got he's the guy who has, like, the most like, pedigree that you can re refer to. Everybody else does feel like more of an up-and-comer, more of, like, an FPL mix. I'm guessing mm -hmm. they didn't pay too crazy buyouts or anything for any of these players. So it does feel like Mad Lions aren't interested in putting together a uh, much of, like, a, a, an expensive roster. It's not a, a high-budget project. That being said, what's curious is that they have instantly gone for a sixth man. And I feel like that's so weird when... You don't have you, you haven't played with any of these players. These players haven't played with any of themselves aside from FPL. Some people were saying, and I can't really corroborate this, that Waro's English isn't even that great, as a, to go back to him briefly. But uh, everybody else, like, okay, communication is going to be pretty whack. This is another uh, sort of mouse sports phase style, like international roster, OG perhaps as well as another recent example. These guys, I'm not 100% sure that they have the ability to immediately, like, hit the ground running necessarily, but... If we buy into the aim star hype, maybe there could be something there. I just don't see like a solid in-game leader on this roster. And that does make me feel like th they might struggle initially. And maybe that's even what you should expect. Like almost Cloud9 style, but at a lower level. 
if you can imagine. Yeah, did, did they announce who who was going to be calling for them? Actually, because yeah, I, that that I, I'm I not 100 percent sure of. I think I, I was I was trying I to process TMB, of elimination right? who's on the roster versus who's like. Someone in chat says he mentioned they plan to pick up a tier one IGL down the road for their seven player roster. Interesting. I, I don't know. I feel like I feel like there's there's definitely a timer on that stuff. If 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 Vitality could have a six man roster and do as well as they did, but they're a six man roster and they still have to move away from the six man roster. And by the way, I don't buy this fucking bullshit that it's about Valve's ruling. Valve's ruling was as favorable for six man rosters as anyone could possibly have fucking expected. Like nobody seriously out here was like, yeah, we really think Valve's going to let us have a six man roster <laughs> yeah, for yeah, the yeah. major. Anyone that thought that was a fucking idiot. Like this, that, that is really just an excuse out of Vitality, like for a reason to go away from it or they think that lands are coming back and they think that it's not that 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 viable on land. So it could have been just an online only thing. I would accept that as well. But their actual reason is fucking bullshit. Um, if they couldn't keep it going for that long, I don't see possibly how Mad Lions could keep it going. Um, I just, I don't see, may, I mean, there's a difference because you don't have Apex and Shocks and those guys who maybe are just like what I would imagine if there was it was because of the six man roster. What probably went down is that, you know, these players um, started thinking, well, we would have won if we had Shocks playing or something like that. Right. Um, we would have won if we had this other player playing or stuff like that. I, I feel like that's going to be even more so in, in, in players that are a little bit less experienced. Um, I don't I don't. I, I listened to Cuban on, on HLTV confirmed and okay. it's he I he sounded really knowledgeable. I, I liked what he had to say. I thought it was really good. I just don't I'm not a huge fan of the six seven man roster thing. Yeah, I think it's odd as well because like you like you're saying, there's there's no longevity in it unless they thought that the tournament circuit was gonna have enough pull that they're able to to pull it off. Especially when it was such a newly adopted thing by tournaments just last year so i mean yeah uh curious but i guess we have to see how it goes i i guess i'm a, i my the the light at the end of the tunnel i think for for this team is i think it's gonna make tmb and tudson look pretty good and i think this is a good platform for them to do that because i think tmb was on agf, on AGF yeah. flames um, um and tudson's kind of he was in secret at one point or another, I believe, and then I don't think that ever that project ever really got off the ground. And we've seen what some of those players could be, like uh, like Anarchez, I think, is another one that was kind of within that circuit and has done quite well. I like TMB. I think TMB's definitely got a chance to show off something good. Um, yeah, it's definitely going to give some players a good chance. Uh, it's just I'm not a I'm not really sold on the it's seven man roster. Like that's. <laughs> little bit much like even what are you, you astralis know, yeah it's like spirit did the six man roster kind of are they're back to five man though right like, yeah are, pretty sure yeah i mean they even tried i wasn't by the way just like this is something that's totally not relevant anymore i wasn't that against the the chopper being subbed out on overpass as everyone else was um chopper being their igl for spirit he was subbed out on overpass because if you ever watch fucking cis overpass it's literally just it's it's <laughs> vertigo except the opposite it's like just go b every round for the whole game and then once or twice maybe consider going a but then probably end b anyways like that really is cis overpass it's just fucking b every round so it's like it, is, is the igl really gonna make that big of a difference when when it's like go b once in a while execute but usually just like hey guys i think it's a good time to run in b right now like like that's a lot of what it is is like maybe off a of flash or like some you know but like a lot of the time it's just like oh look at that mirrors on b and he killed their whole team <laughs> like i guess that's how this round plays would out. you look at the time yeah. yeah i wasn't i wasn't as against it as other people were but that's just an aside i think there's some players on the on the mad lions roster that that have a, will have a chance to prove themselves I just don't think the longevity of a seven man roster is going to be that good. It almost it almost looks like a, a project that is designed to get those players out into the tier 1 circuit, you know, kind of like uh acquire uh, the acquisition from Mouse Sports from Acor, you know, they might have seen that and been like, "Oh, yeah, you know, this is some some decent <laughs> chunk of change. You know, we can we can try and spin this somehow as well with with some players that maybe will will have a better platform as a result of that. I mean, I, I don't doubt that 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 is probably going to happen later down the line. But I don't see the this five man roster, or what I imagine will be trimmed down to a five man roster eventually, sure, yeah. succeeding too much.
Yeah, and I think that's probably a fair place for them and maybe they become a feeder uh, organization to other international mm-hmm. lineups because that does seem to be picking up in frequency, especially in the upper echelons of Counter-Strike. So we'll, we'll give them some time. Maybe they can gel in a couple months, but I wouldn't expect excellence immediately. I think that's that much is safe to say, especially since they will be apparently uh, swapping players in and out and stuff. So If It'll only be- Mad Lions published how much they were going to pay their older players. Yeah, then yeah, there the- you go. <laughs> And then, yeah. It, yeah, and then it's just like if you take cloud nine salary, but you divide it by like 10 or something, it's like ridiculous. <laughs> I can only imagine. Well, there you go. I guess to close us out here, we can have some final words and shout outs. Do you have anything in particular coming out here, Yumi? And any, uh, any plans? Obviously, you're still doing the casting. So maybe you want to shut some of that stuff out. Uh, yeah, I'm, tomorrow I'm doing some more of the, the blast qualifiers, highlighting the Nordic region. I think there's Mad Lines are actually competing in that, if I'm, pre- oh, I'm pretty sure. The, okay. the prep work is tonight, so I'll have uh, more time to go through all of that. Um, but yeah, catch catch the stream tomorrow, I guess. Or or don't, and then you can catch the VOD. Uh, just as long as you catch it somehow. somehow uh, other than somehow. that, don't really have, have too much going on. I, I'm just continuing on casting. I've been still working up the courage to, to write the script down for a thing that I want to do, but that is okay. still very far in the pipeline. So see you in two years. So that's, <laughs> there that's it is. Yeah, that's when you script longer. shit, it just, it just like, it never seems funny when you write it out. It's like, I had to write out, um, for, for, uh, for leadify to write, I was writing out an ad, uh, or like a, a joke segment. And I was mm. like, th- I just wrote it down to get it out of my head. And then I was like, are you guys fine with this? And then I gave it to them. And I'm like, wow, if you read this, it looks like I'm a fucking idiot. Like, <laughs> this just does not read funny at all. But I know it's going to be fucking hilarious. You just, you like, you have to have this next level of self-confidence yeah. to actually do that shit. Yeah. Yeah, and it's exceptionally difficult to do that when you're uh, neck deep in casting gigs like Yumi is right now. So I totally understand. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I, so. I definitely have the time. I'm just it's hard to allocate it when you you know you want you do want the days off every so often yeah but sure of course yeah i'm just not i'm just not a content I'm just not i don't have that content drive as of yet maybe soon 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 well one man who does is of course vu he's just put out a new video you guys can check that out and any other exciting shout outs or, or previews i know you got a couple others in the pipeline nacs right? fucking sucks dude nacs is a <laughs> fucking joke NACS is a fucking disaster. You have players dropping 18-year-old, like, future of CS players to pick up these fucking washed-up 30-year-olds that have <laughs> fucked their, have fucked over every roster they've ever been on before in their life, and then it fucking happens again. Who would have fucking thunk it? Who would have thought? Who would have thought that this guy that fucked out everyone else over was going to fuck over our roster? We dropped our fucking future of CS for this shit? Absolute fucking joke, dude. NACS is so bad, and I just needed to get that off my chest before we ended it. There you go. NACS fucking sucks, and we'll see you next week sometime for another episode. Actually, we'll have an April 1st episode. Epic April Fool's joke, so tune in then. And thank you very much, Yumi, for joining. We will be back at some point. I don't know when. You'll see. Bye. NACS is a fucking joke.